Welcome back. In the last video we talked about products of blood donation and what kind of uses these products have. In this video we're going to cover the next dot point which is all about artificial blood. I read the actual dot point. It says students will analyze and present information from secondary sources to report on progress in the production of artificial blood and use available evidence to propose reasons why such research is needed. Just two parts to this dot point. First, you have to report, which means we just have to talk about, report on progress in the production of artificial blood. So we have to talk about how far are we when it makes when it comes to making artificial blood. And the second part was and use available evidence to propose reasons why such research is needed. So we have to talk about why do we actually need to have artificial blood. That was the second part. And we'll actually I'll start talking about the second part first. So why do we need to have research in artificial blood? And this is why. So there's a couple of reasons. First of all, because we have a lack of supply. People don't, at the moment, so people don't donate enough. That's what I'm writing. People don't donate enough blood. And because of that, we don't have enough blood in our supplies. So if we can make artificial blood, remember artificial means human-made. So we can make blood ourselves in the laboratory. That means we wouldn't have to rely on people donating blood. So that's one of the reasons why we need to make sure we get more artificial blood happening because that means we can actually make our own blood. Another reason why was because of risk of infection. Now this is particularly important in developing countries. So developing countries and many parts of Africa are developing. So for example this here is a map of the prevalence so how, how likely it is that people have AIDS in in this case Africa. So you have this map shows you the darker it is, the more likely it is. We have South Africa, so this part here. These parts of South Africa, see, and there's a couple of different countries close by. They have a really high prevalence of 20 to 30 percent of people living there have AIDS. Now, when it comes to don blood donations, see, there might be some people there who donate blood, and they haven't actually, they don't realize they actually have AIDS, and the people who get the blood don't realize that the person has had, had AIDS and haven't been able to screen it properly. What that means is they might risk giving AIDS, give AIDS to the people who receive the blood, so give AIDS to res, res, recipients. That just means the people who receive the blood. So because of the of blood, and especially in these countries which are developing, it's possible that you would have an infection and you don't pick up on it, and you give that blood to someone else, and the person who gets the blood gets the same problems, for example, AIDS. So that's another reason why we can, if we make artificial blood, we can make sure it's sterile and infection-free. So we can make sure no infection gets transmitted. So that was the second reason. So we've got lack of supply so far. And to eliminate, to remove the risk of infection. And another one was the compatibility issues. Now, it's three different, uh, four different blood groups when it comes to human beings. And this is also quite similar for most animals. There's O, A, B and AB. Now I'm actually the blood group O and these are known as the givers and there's a really reason why as well. Because if you look at this actual table here, the tick means that in this case I can take, I'm O, I can take people's, other people's O blood, but I can't take, if someone is an A and gives me blood, I can't take that. I can't take someone that gives me a B blood or AB blood. I can only take the O blood, whereas my blood everyone can have it. So A can grab that blood, that's fine. B can grab that blood and AB can grab that blood. So as an O, blood type O, I can give it to anyone, but I can only take from my own blood type. And here, for example, is the likelihood of people being different blood types. And O minus and O positive are these two. So overall, there are more than 40% of people who can only take O blood, but can't, but they can give their blood, but they can't take blood from anyone else but O. Whereas all the other ones can take it from everyone. Like a, B can take it from everyone, and then A can take it from O and A. But if we can make blood which is O, so if we can artificially make O blood, what that means is we can, we can make blood that everyone can have. Because the problem is if I get, for example, B blood or AB blood, if that's put into me, then I would actually start dying. I would have a reaction, I would start dying. 
But if we can make this O blood, that means I can take that blood, but everyone else can take the blood. Any, any person can take O positive blood, for example, right? So that's one way we can make sure we have no problem when it comes to compatibility issues. Another reason was a short half-life. Now, red blood cells do not last long. So red blood cells don't last long, but if we can make artificial blood, we might be able to increase the shelf life, which means how long it can last in the shelf. So here it's, it's in the shelf somewhere, and after a couple of months, this will be not usable anymore. But if we can make artificial blood that lasts longer, then we don't want to have a problem. We can store it for somewhere, and we can have that for there for quite some time. So these were four reasons. So I mentioned the four reasons again. Make sure to remember some of these because you should know them. We have a lack of supply, so if we can make artificial blood, that means we can make more and more, and we won't have a problem with supply anymore. We eliminate the risk of infection, so that means people won't get AIDS from getting um, receiving blood. We can eliminate the compatibility issues. If we can make O positive blood, that means everyone can grab that blood. Whereas if we make AB blood, for example, that no one can grab that except for AB. And it has a short half-life, so we can increase the shelf life if we make artificial blood. Now the next part was analyze this information from signature sources to report on the progress in the production of artificial blood. So this is now we're talking about the report. How far are we when it comes to making artificial blood? We can already make some of these. We can make parafluorocarbon emulsion. So parafluorocarbon emulsion. This emulsion refers to fat because this parafluorocarbon molecule is actually here. So it's actually inside a fat molecule. These are the lipids here around it. So this is a lipid or a fat. And inside we have that parafluorocarbon emulsion. And this is something called an oxygen carrier. So this is a replacement to our hemoglobin. Right? So we can already make parafluorocarbon emulsions, and these help us carry oxygen. So if we don't have enough red blood cells, we can make these parafluorocarbon emulsions, and they help us do the same function. We also have something called hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers, or HBOCs for short. Now these do the same thing. These are actually... Uh, old, very old hemoglobins that have been modified, so artificially modified, and they do the same function as our normal hemoglobin. So here we have a red blood cell. Remember, red blood cells have hemoglobin and they carry oxygen. Here we have the other two. So the red thing on the line here is a parafluorocarbon emulsion, and the other one, the tiny one, that is a hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier, which was this one here. Now the major problem with this one is that the red blood cells they have a in they survive in a body for about sixty days, so they have a life of sixty days. These red blood cells, whereas the ones we can make in the moment, perfluorocarbon emulsion and the hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers, these here survive for about twelve to twenty-four hours. So until we can actually make something which lives a bit longer, then while it's useful to have these these artificial blood. They aren't that useful yet because they live way too long compared to our normal red blood cells. So we're still looking, we're still trying to research something which will last a bit longer. But this is what we have at the moment. We have parafluorocarbon emulsions and early days when it comes to these hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers, which were these two here. We also, we also have crystalloids. This is saline solution. So saline solution is just basically salt water and a couple other things in it, some couple other electrolytes. And this here replaces plasma. So you know, remember what plasma was? Plasma is mostly water. And this crystalloids are it's quite similar. But what this allows us to do is it allows us to increase our blood volume. So we can increase our blood volume, which means if someone has lost a lot of blood, especially our, the plasma, they can have this crystalloid solution injected and it will have a short term uh, effect, a positive effect, increasing the blood volume until they make their own plasma again. So that's what we have when it comes to CNS solution. We can make these crystalloids. But the one thing we don't have, we don't have that really good oxygen carrier yet, the one that lasts for a lot longer. But this one is maybe going to be that solution. So I don't have a picture of this yet because we don't actually have this yet. So this here, we don't have yet. So the microcapsules, 
they might be able to carry much more oxygen than what our previous perifluorocarbon emulsion and hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier can. Plus, it can also last longer. But the problem is, yeah, it's still early days. We, we are still at least 10 years off to having this properly developed. So I'll summarize how far are we when it comes to the progress in production of artificial blood. We have perifluorocarbon emulsion, which was this one on top here, and the hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers. Both of these are extracts that help us to carry oxygen, so they help us replace hemoglobin. Problem is they don't last very long, so they last about one day in our body compared to six days for red blood cell. Now we also have crystalloids, which is a saline solution that helps us to re replace plasma, and that's what we have at the moment, and that increases our blood volume. What we don't have yet are these microcapsules. These will generally last for a lot longer than these other previous technologies, and they can carry more oxygen, but the problem is they haven't been produced yet. They're probably still at least 10 years off when it comes to production. So you remember the reasons why we need them and the technologies as well that I just mentioned. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.